Greta Garbo is often depicted as a sad, lonely, tragic recluse. This is a fiction. The real Garbo was very different. She was a spiritual seeker. She rejected the ideas of Orthodox Christianity and turned instead to Eastern mysticism, transcendental meditation, theosophy and the occult. She had a close circle of friends who she saw regularly. These included Aristotle Onassis, Cecile de Rothschild, Montgomery Clift and David Niven. After she retired from acting, she moved to one of the busiest cities in the world, New York, and she would often go walking in the green spaces of that city, often with a friend, not alone. Of course, the most famous quote attributed to Garbo is, I want to be alone. But this is a misquote. What she really said was, I want to be let alone. And she meant, I want to be let alone by the press. Garbo was a very private individual. She did not go to her own Hollywood movie premieres. She did not give formal interviews. She did not dress up, put makeup on and have her hair done to go out in public. These were the things that the press and the patriarchy wanted her to do. When she wouldn't do them, they punished her for it. So when she said, I want to be let alone, they didn't like that. So they changed it. Greta Garbo was born Greta Levisa Gustafsson on the 18th of September 1905. And her family uh, were very poor. They lived in a slum area of Stockholm called Sörde Malm. And they lived in a tiny two-room cold water flat with an outside toilet shared by the whole block. From a very young age, uh, she dreamed of becoming an actress and she would hang around the theatres in Stockholm and she became a familiar face at the stage doors. Sometimes the person on the stage door would take pity on her and uh, let her in to watch some of the show. She thought this was magical. She said that when she was watching a play it felt like the gates of heaven were opening. Her big break came in 1922 when she got into the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in Stockholm. And through sheer pestering, almost stalking of directors, she managed to get herself parts in three major films while she was still a student. One of those films was Jörster Berling's Saga, directed by Moritz Stiller. Moritz Stiller would become a big influence in Garbo's life. Jörster Berling's saga tells the story of a disgraced priest who is thrown out of the church. And themes of spirituality and the occult occur again and again in Garbo's films, as we'll see later on. In 1925, Moritz Stiller took Greta Garbo to America. And between 1926 and 1942, she made a total of 26 films. And she became the biggest film star on the planet. And what we're going to look at tonight is that rebellious spirit of Greta Garbo, that spirit which rejected the orthodox and the conventional in mainstream life, but also in religion and spirituality. And what happened, or rather who happened, to Greta Garbo to turn her interest towards the esoteric and the occult? Now the key to understanding the spirituality and the spiritual journey of Garbo comes from understanding the degree to which she was an early example of somebody who was highly self-actualised. Self-actualisation as a term was first coined by the German neurologist Kurt Goldstein and the baton was later picked up by um, the American psychologist Abraham Maslow. And Maslow put it into his now famous hierarchy of needs. Self-actualization means to achieve one's fullest potential as a human being, including creatively. And Maslow said that um, self-actualization was the single ultimate value for humankind, a far goal towards which all human beings strive. So what are the qualities of people who are self-actualized? Well, first of all, people who are self-actualized uh, are authentic and self-integrated. 
they have a strong sense of internal harmony and internal unity. The person they are on the inside is exactly the person they present to the world on the outside. They have a strong sense of self and of self-worth. They will not be bullied or pushed around by other people. Now this was very much Garbo in terms of the bullying that she received at the hands of Louis B. Mayer, who was the head of MGM Studios. She would not budge, and that made her unique um, as, a, as an actress in Hollywood, or an actor in Hollywood. They have a strong sense of uh, self and of self-worth. Um, Self-actualised people um, uh, are also independent thinkers. They um, will not blindly follow the majority view. They, they will find their own path, even if that makes them an outsider. And uh, they, are, uh, they have a strong uh, sense of uh, unity consciousness. They see everything in nature and in the universe as interconnected and interdependent. They see unity more than they see separation. They are able to simply be for long periods of time in contemplation. So they are unperturbed by silence and solitude. And they can live in the present moment more fully and more often than other people. And this is what made Garbo such a consummate actress. When she played a character, she could literally inhabit the skin of that character uh, fully and completely in that moment. And that gave her a powerful presence before a camera. And finally, two things. Um, Self-actualised people are what Ken Wilber described as cosmocentric thinkers. They are unrestricted by national or cultural boundaries uh, in the way that they view the world. They are keen to embrace uh, spiritualities and cultures and the ideas of those spiritualities and cultures um, that are not their own, that not the one that they were born into. And finally, they're what Colin Wilson described as peakers. They have more peak experiences uh, more often than other people. A peak experience is a feeling of absolute uh, bliss and joy simply at being alive. A feeling where all sense of separateness from uh, nature and the world simply melts away. So from a young age, uh, Greta Gustafsson showed uh, this potentiality for uh, self-actualization for somebody who could grow to become self-actualized and a free spirit. Uh, as a child living in cramped conditions, she craved silence and solitude. She would often retreat to a corner of her parents' tiny flat just to be on her own. And once her Aunt Maria said to her, what on earth are you doing sat here on your own like this? And at the age of five, she said, I am thinking about the time when I'll be a great actress. <laughs> uh, when she was ten years old, uh, her family were regular visitors to the soup kitchens, but she would go to the soup kitchens on her own as well, uh, not to eat, but to entertain the people in the queue. And at the age of 10, uh, she would be dressed as the goddess of peace, wrapped in a white bedsheet that she had borrowed from home. She would be reciting uh, poems that uh, she had written about peace and love and harmony. She got a job as a lava girl in a barber shop. And uh, every morning she would come in and she would hug the owner's wife and she would talk about her dreams of becoming an actress. And sometimes during the day she would just burst out laughing and start dancing around the shop, having a peak experience. When the owner asked her why she was laughing, she said, why isn't everybody? Uh, but these um, early indicators of potential to become self-actualized did not mean that she would ultimately get there in the end. And as she grew older, uh, she became rather awkward. When she arrived in America with Moritz Stiller on the Drottningholm cruise ship in 1925, she was already uh, under a contract with MGM. Louis B. Mayer had been to Berlin and he had seen her uh, in Jörster Berling Saga during a screening. And he signed her up because he said there was something mystical behind the eyes. But the contract that she had was pretty rubbish. She was just on the books at MGM. She didn't have a, a, a film to be in. She didn't have a role to play. And the reception committee at the dockside in New York was also pretty paltry. A handful of people from MGM and a, a handful of journalists. Among those journalists was Dorothy Woodridge. She was decidedly unimpressed by Greta Garbo. She said of her, her shoes were run down at the heels. Her stockings were silk, but in one was a well-defined run. As a sartorial masterpiece, she was a total loss. 
The MGM vice president, Edward Bowes, predicted that Greta Garbo would be sailing back to Sweden within six months. And uh, the MGM uh, executive, um, Nicholas Schenk, said uh, that when uh, Moritz Stiller tried to arrange a meeting between him and Garbo, he said that he was far too busy, uh, he didn't have the time, far too grand. And yet the same Nicholas Schenk trembled and stuttered just two years later when he finally shook the hands of the woman who had now become the great Garbo. But perhaps the most interesting story comes from somebody who didn't meet Garbo, and that was Orson Welles. Orson Welles was interviewed in 1974 on the Michael Parkinson show, and uh, he described a trip to Sweden when he was uh, shown uh, some footage of Garbo in uh, uh, an early advertisement that she appeared in for a bakery, and he is very ungracious. He said, uh, you were looking at the screen, and on the screen was this great big galumphing Swedish cow having a picnic. <laughs> there was nothing to tell you that you were looking at somebody who would become the most divine creature ever to appear on a movie screen. He said, I have no explanation whatsoever for how that transformation took place. So what happened, or who happened, to awkward, galumphing Greta Gustafsson to turn her into the divine Garbo? Enter Moritz Stiller. Moritz Stiller was uh, born in Finland in 1883. He was Jewish and he was gay. And in 1904, he fled Finland to escape conscription, and he pitched up in Stockholm. And he got some work at Charles Magnusson's uh, Svenska Bio Film Company. After a while, he was allowed to have a go at directing. And he had a flair for it. He was Moritz Stiller was a genius. He was an unconventional character and an outsider. And Garbo was drawn to unconventional outsiders all her life because she herself was an unconventional outsider. Uh, Moritz Stiller was a flamboyant character. He, he wore pastel suits, he wore ankle-length fur coats, he was dripping in jewellery, and he drove a bright yellow Kissel motor car around Stockholm. You couldn't fail to spot Moritz Stiller in a crowd, and he became quite well known for his flamboyance. He had a particular vision. He wanted to find an actress who he could mould into a great star, but she had to have three particular qualities. She had to be super sensual, she had to be spiritual, and she had to be mystic. When he met Greta Gustafsson, he saw these qualities in abundance, but they were raw. So he decided he would work with her and mentor her to help her transform into someone and something else. So the spiritual and mystic qualities of Greta Garbo. In 1929, uh, Garbo appeared in two films, uh, Wild Orchids and the groundbreakingly feminist uh, Single Standard. In both those films, her co-star was her fellow Swede, Nils Astor. One day on set, she was looking particularly unhappy, and Astor asked her why she was looking so sad. Garbo replied, I had an awful row with God this morning. For Greta Garbo, everybody had an immediate and... Uh, Un, unrupturable almost connection with the divine. Uh, you could connect with God, the universe, the cosmos, wherever you were, whenever you were, uh, in Greta Garbo's view. She said that building churches was a waste of time and a waste of money. Everyone had what he or she needed inside him or her to connect with God. In 1933, she played a role she had been desperate to play for years, and that was Queen, Queen Christine, as, as uh, was already mentioned. Uh, in the film, her advisor says to her that the Swedish people are fighting a war for their faith and for their God. Garbo replies, but what about the enemy's God? For Queen Christina and for Garbo in her own life, the idea that one uh, religion or spiritual tradition was the one true religion was unsupportable. For Garbo to, to explore a range of spiritualities and spiritual traditions and find one's own truth through that exploration had to be the nobler path. 
It's what the psychologist Roberto Assagioli described as being part of a spiritual, super-individual reality. Now, in a clearing in a forest in Sweden, there is a statue of Greta Garbo, and it's called the Statue of Integrity. There are no signposts for it, there's no fanfare around it. You are literally meant to stumble across it with your backpack. And uh, it represents Garbo's intense, almost pagan connection with nature. She had an intense intimacy with the elements. Uh, her costume designer, Adrian, described her, as, uh, described her beauty as essentially a spiritual one. The uh, MGM publicist, Hubert Voigt, described Garbo as a child of the sun shining with light. And her lover, Mercedes de Acosta, described Garbo as a radiant goddess of the elements. When Garbo was uh, 18 years old and she'd just finished filming Yerster Berling's saga, she used uh, some of the money to rent a cottage in a remote part of Värmland County in Sweden. And every day she would go out uh, in nature all the time. But for Garbo, she wasn't isolated and she wasn't alone because she was with her favourite companion, nature. When uh, she lived in Hollywood uh, and in the sprawl of Los Angeles, she would crave communion with nature. She would go up to the mountains and sit there looking out at the ocean. She would go up to Silver Lake and sit in the middle of the lake uh, on a boat for ages. And when it was a huge thunderstorm and a downpour in Los Angeles, when everyone else was running in, Garbo was running out. Uh, she loved to be close to the power of nature, uh, to see the, see the lightning and uh, hear the thunder, and to feel the pelting of the rain on her skin. She'd be out there for ages, getting absolutely drenched and loving it. So all of these uh, things, all of these values and ideas were swirling around within Greta Garbo. Uh, this feeling of oneness with the cosmos, this feeling of oneness with nature, this feeling that... Organised religion couldn't provide her with the answers to the questions that she had. So what happened, or again, who happened, uh, to channel all this energy towards the esoteric and the occult? Enter Mercedes de Acosta. Mercedes de Acosta was a Spanish-American poet and playwright. She was an unconventional figure, surprise, surprise. And uh, as, as a child, she lived ostensibly as a boy. When her parents sent her away to be educated, the nuns were horrified and attempted to, attempted to feminise her. Mercedes hated it and ran away. She described herself as neither male nor female, but something other. And this resonated with Garbo because she uh, saw herself in, in similar terms. She would often describe herself in male terms and sometimes describe herself in male and female terms in the same sentence. Sadies was deeply interested in the occult. She uh, was a friend and devotee of the Indian mystics Sri Meher Baba and Ramana Maharshi. She studied with Sri Meher Baba in Paris and she went on a spiritual odyssey to India uh, and uh, spent time with Ramana Maharshi in his ashram. She read at the age of, well when she was a teenager, she read H.P. Uh, Blavatsky's The Secret Doctrine. She said of the secret doctrine that it was the one book which every seeker of the spiritual truth must read. She became friends with notable theosophists, such as Eleanor S. Cooley, uh, and was a friend of um, the occult author Alice Bailey. And she also became friends with Jiddu Krishnamurti, who was uh, proclaimed as the New World Teacher of Theosophy uh, by Annie Besant, the president of the Theosophical Society at the time. Um, she said of Krishnamurti that he was the one person who represented the true and authentic California, the spiritual California, not the fake, glitzy, glamorised Hollywood California. Now this again resonated with Garbo because Garbo wanted to be a great actress, she wanted to play fascinating roles, but the whole um, media circus and the uh, celebrity culture, the deification of film stars, the red carpets, the ball gowns and the screaming and all of that. She thought it was absolute nonsense. She couldn't stand it. There were, she thought there were better things to be doing with one's time. Now when Mercedes and um, Garbo met, they instantly hit it off and uh, they became friends and then lovers. 
and shortly after they met, uh, they went to the mountains in Casa del Mar and they spent the whole night uh, together on the top of the mountain talking about spiritual and occult ideas, meditating and contemplating. And it was then that Mercedes de Acosta initiated Greta Garbo into the ideas of theosophy and the occult. But she was not the only influence uh, on Garbo's spiritual life. In 1936, uh, Garbo went to a party uh, given by Anita Luce, who was the novelist and screenwriter responsible for Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. At the party, she met the classical conductor and occultist Leopold Stokowski. The first thing he said when he met Greta Garbo was that he and she shared a destiny that had been written in the stars by the very gods themselves. Now this very original and unorthodox chat-up line clearly worked uh, because uh, Garbo and Stokowski embarked on uh, a sexual relationship. And part of their relationship involved Stokowski regaling Garbo with uh, tales of his spiritual adventures in India. And one story was of great interest to her. He told her of the time when he had spent a day on a mountaintop with an Indian mystic. And they had discussed all sorts of spiritual questions. It was only when they parted that Stokowski realised that the Indian mystic spoke no English and he spoke no Hindi, and yet they had understood each other perfectly. Now, apart from the wonderful mystical aspect of that story, it was of interest to Garbo because it was a mirror of her own experience uh, a number of years before. Only then, on the mountaintop, it was uh, Mercedes who was the master and Garbo who was the initiate. Another important influence um, on Garbo's spiritual life was the art dealer and occultist Sam Green. And she spent a lot of time with him uh, when she lived in New York in the 70s and early 80s. And they would often discuss uh, topics such as reincarnation, uh, mediumship and communication with spirits. Everybody that Garbo met, she felt, had the ability to offer her a spiritual nugget. So she would often ask anybody, once she got to know them, what do you believe about God? Cecil Beaton, uh, the photographer and friend of Garbo's, described her as an enigma brimming with spiritual thoughts. Mercedes de Acosta said that Garbo had a profound soul quality that lifted her beyond the material world. And Leif Erikson, her co-star in Marie Velishka, said that she was like the hippie of the world, surveying the scene but not partaking. It puts one in mind of that phrase of being uh, in the world but not of the world. Garbo said that the uh, Orthodox Church's literal reading of the Bible with its idea of hellfire and damnation was asinine. She said that there was an esoteric meaning to the Bible and when one knew that, then one knew that uh, goodness was truly the greatest force in the universe. Now, Garbo had a particularly difficult experience uh, with uh, an, somebody who was a friend of hers, uh, and then they fell out, and uh, this person was a devout Catholic. Uh, and that was uh, the dress designer, Valentina. Valentina and her husband, George Schley, became friends with Garbo for a while, and they would, they would often be out uh, together as a happy laughing trio. But Valentina and George's relationship was uh, a cold one. Their marriage was rather a cold one. And as they drifted apart, Garbo and George Schley drifted together. But their relationship was purely platonic. There was no sex involved at all. And he became her de facto um, business manager. Valentina became insanely jealous. And when George died, she barred Garbo from attending his funeral. She hired a Catholic priest to exorcise her own apartment to remove any trace of where Garbo might have been. Now Garbo was very hurt by these actions and it just reinforced her view that there was an awful lot of hypocrisy in uh, mainstream religion. She said she could not understand how somebody could make the sign of the cross and pray every day and yet behave so maliciously towards another human being. And it served to just move her further in the direction of Eastern spiritual ideas. 
she wrote to her friend, the Countess Ingrid Herky Vatmeister, uh, talking about how she was thinking of giving up acting for good and travelling to the East to seek out beings who could teach her a new way of living. Now this may be a veiled reference from Garbo to uh, the uh, headquarters of the Theosophical Society in Adyar in India. And it could also be a veiled reference to the uh, Mahatmas of Theosophy, the Masters of the Wisdom. In 1939, uh, Garbo attended a party. Now she wasn't a great party goer, but she was determined to attend this party. It was thrown by Aldous Huxley. And uh, she knew that at the party, uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti was going to be there. And uh, she turned up in her usual straw hat and pair of old slacks. And she accosted Krishnamurti and she uh, spent a great deal of time deep in conversation with him, uh, wanting to learn all she could from the great um, spiritual teacher. Her interest in theosophy continued for the rest of her life. In 1951, the travel writer James Pope Hennessy met Garbo and he found her to be a rather strange character. Uh, he said of her, she's interested in theosophy, dieting and all other cranky subjects. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, a lot of uh, Garbo's films feature spiritual and occult themes. At the opening of um, uh, the opening scenes of Mata Hari, she performs a sacred Javanese temple dance. In Camille, she tells her lover, Armand's father, that she's, she has had a powerful premonition of her own impending death. And in Anna Christie, she hints at reincarnation and after-death states. She describes being lost in a fog uh, that seemed to last for all eternity, only to emerge with no memory of the life she had before. And in The Painted Veil, she describes her love for China. She says it is a country so full of spells, they seem to be the reason for everything. She attends a sun and moon festival uh, and watches a dance where dancers perform um, the story of how the sun god slayed a dragon uh, to free his lover so that the two of them could travel across the heavens for all eternity. She then visits a temple and has her fortune told and she is told that the temple is inhabited by powerful and ancient gods. Uh, Garbo's spiritual quest led her to adopt a semi-ascetic lifestyle. Every day she would get up at 6am to do yoga and breathing exercises. She only ate natural foods. She said she could only eat food that was close to the earth. She became a friend and devotee of the founder of the whole food movement, Gaylord Hauser. And um, he recommended uh, reduction rather than abstinence. So Garbo said she had had the same bottle of glug for year after year after year. Her home was a Spartan one. She, uh, she said that one should have one's material possessions, they should be there to look at whenever you want, but if they go, they go. That's it. Cecil Beaton described Garbo as a true ascetic, a Spartan warrior interested only in the purer aspects of life. Mercedes said that Garbo lived not just a solitary life, but a simple and austere one as well. And the novelist Sinclair Lewis said that of all the actors that he knew in Hollywood, Garbo was the one he loved the most, because she was the only one who never went Hollywood. There was one thing that Garbo could not reduce or deny herself. In 1939, Mercedes read an article by Gandhi uh, in which he said that nicotine thickened the spiritual body and hampered its development. Mercedes immediately quit smoking. Garbo didn't. Reincarnation was something which was of uh, interest and a belief of Garbo's uh, from a very young age. Uh, in 1931, when Mercedes met her and they shook hands, Mercedes had an instant impression that the two of them had met before. Not uh, just uh, in this life, but in, in many previous lives. When Garbo's father died in 1920, she said that she knew he was still in existence. Not uh, in heaven or hell, uh, but in another plane of existence other than the physical plane. And when she travelled to Berlin in 1924 to attend the premiere of Jöster Berling's saga, she was overwhelmed by a powerful and familiar smell. 
When she arrived in Berlin, she realised that it was the smell of the city. It was the smell of Berlin. And the city seemed familiar. She knew where things were. She said that she realised then that she had lived in Berlin in a previous incarnation. And when she was in New York with uh, Sam Green, spending time with Sam Green, uh, they read Joan Grant's book, Far Memory. Joan Grant was an English historical novelist who um, said that she had the gift of far memory. She could remember her past lives, and that provided her with the, the material for her historical novels. But Garbo was playful with a lot of ideas, and uh, she said that in her next life she wanted to come back as Chinese, because Chinese people didn't get wrinkles. <laughs> Um, Garbo believed that human beings, uh, the human body was too frail for us to truly comprehend the nature of the infinite. Um, once when she was in hospital under ether, she had a vision and she said that um, she thought she had discovered eternity, but it was not for human beings to discover. So therefore, she had discovered nothing. She felt that for us to stare into the abyss or to attempt to touch the void, as it were, would be too much for us. It would fry our brains or, or blow our minds. Um, in Queen Christina, her lover, Don Antonio, played by her on-off lover, John Gilbert, uh, says that he, he detects there is, is a deep mystery within her. And Garbo replies, is there not a deep mystery within every human being? Astral travel was something which was of great interest to Mercedes and Garbo, and they experimented with it. Mercedes had read up on how adepts in the East practiced astral travel, and once when Garbo was in her hotel room in Stockholm on a visit to Sweden, Mercedes projected her astral body into the room. When the two of them compared notes, Mercedes' impressions of the room were exact. But this just served uh, to... Uh, reinforced Garbo's own feeling that when two people shared a strong emotional connection, they developed a strong psychic connection. She said to her friend, um, the Countess Ingrid herke wattmeister that uh, she could pop into Herke's mind any time she wanted, just by focusing her thoughts. In Anna Karenina, Garbo plays the title role, and in the film uh, she is banished from her home by her husband, who is played by Basil Rathbone. He tells their son, Sergei, that uh, his mother is dead. He's banished her because he's found out she's having an affair with a Russian army officer. And he tells their son, Sergei, uh, that his mother is dead. Sergei refuses to believe this, and he suggests that the two of them will meet on the astral plane. He says, when I close my eyes and go to sleep, I know the mother will come to kiss me goodnight. So, to sum up, Greta Garbo, not quite the sad and tragic, lonely recluse that we have been uh, led to believe that she was. She was indeed a spiritual explorer, interested in occult ideas. Her companions on that journey were Mercedes de Acosta, Leopold Stokowski and Sam Green. Mercedes uh, once said that she believed, Mercedes believed, that artists could never become truly spiritually developed because it would mean losing their egos and becoming detached. Perhaps in Greta Garbo she found the one who could do exactly that. <laughs> and how they are able to assume a personality that's world famous, but they are not actually that personality. And like Abba, for example, and there's other examples uh, I can mention, do you think she had any of that Swedish nature in her that allowed her to do this um, trick of you know, becoming very famous but not letting you change her personality? Uh, well, she was very egalitarian, and uh, she was very down to earth. Um, and uh, she was very good at what she did. Um, uh, for her, she was a jobbing actress. So the whole, the whole thing of... Um, she, she was absolutely brilliant at what she did, and that was what made people so interested in her, because she was so good at it. So um, 
And I think that, you know, the, the, the same is true perhaps of ABBA. Um, but th all sorts of things are created around people. Um, you know, uh, so you can be very, very good at what you do and people will create, or the, the industry of whatever it be, will create um, a, a kind of image around you. I mean, I know that um, uh, Ag Agneta Feltskog, who was the, the blonde singer from ABBA, uh, shied away from uh, publicity and was not interested in it. She was much more interested in raising a family. Um, and of course, again, the press punished her for that because, uh, you know, all this nonsense about she married her stalker. I mean, it's just drivel. It's absolute drivel. They will make up whatever they like. If you upset the patriarchy and you upset the press, you are in trouble. And that was true for Garbo and for An Anjeta Feltskup as well. Um, you know, both have been painted as kind of sad, lonely old women. You know, you can't get a man. What a shame for you. That's your, that's your purpose in life. You know, it, and, and um, I think good, good on them that they, they didn't put up with it and, and Garbo wouldn't engage with it. Um, no, that I haven't found any evidence for that. She was she was very interested in theosophy and she was interested in transcendental meditation as well. So um, this idea that she was kind of sat on her own, you know, crying into her vodka or something, but uh, is, is just nonsense. She she was she was meditating and, and she would she she wasn't somebody who joined in. So so she, I did check. She didn't join the Theosophical Society, for example, um, but she would find her own spiritual path in her own way. Um, and uh, yeah, so so I'm not quite sure that, that there was anything. But if if you ever discover something, then let me know and I'll update it. <laughs> Anybody? Anybody else? Yes. What made you write about her? Why were you drawn to her? I was drawn to her Swedishness, um, strangely enough, uh, because um, ever since I was a child, I was obsessed strangely with Sweden, and nobody knew why. Um, and I would become very angry when people would. Yes, yes. Well, I, I had a, I had a, a spiritual experience, and I travelled back through my past lives when I was having an achievement to be a Reiki master, and um, it was then that, that I that I realised that I had been Swedish in a not so distant past life, and that was where my uh, obsession and obsession with ABBA actually when I was about eight years old, I was obsessed with ABBA because they were the only Swedish thing I could get hold of and I, I remember looking at pictures of them and, and looking past them at the background thinking, is that Sweden? Um, so it was quite an obsession and, and I didn't understand why so. It could be maybe you were connected to her in a previous life, you know, who knows you know? Possibly, yeah, yeah. I mean that, that's a, a kind of theosophical concept as well, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, that, that's where it comes from. It's an obsession with Sweden and um, all things Sweden. Um, have, you been, have, you been, like, have you been to Sweden before? Yeah, I lived in Sweden for a couple oh, really? of years. It was such a great obsession that I ended up going there. I had to go. I learned English. To, I learned to teach English as a foreign language uh, to go to Sweden. Um, and I did. <laughs> so it was quite a, quite a thing for me. I'm actually I loved Swedish. Ah, oh, how marvellous. I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, any other, any other questions? How long did it take you to write this book, all the research, everything? Oh, the research is, is, is huge. How do you go about it, you know? Um, uh, well, looking at... Uh, Garbo is now very much a historical figure, so it's quite difficult to find anybody who, who was a contemporary of hers and speak to them. So it's very much researching um, uh, from transcripts of interviews and, and all of those different things and, and contacting the Swedish Embassy, for example. Um, contacting uh, the um, genealogy um, organizer, Rida Husset. Is it Rida Husset? Oh, no. Rida? No. Uh, I've got completely confused with that one. Um, but, you know, contacting organizations in Sweden, contacting the Theosophical Society in America, etc., um, to, to gain as much information as, as possible. So, but it took three years. I, I, 18 months in, I, I binned everything I'd done and started again. And how did you decide <laughs> what information to put in the book? Sometimes when you talk to people, people may not always speak the truth, you know what I mean? Mm. The truth can be twisted a little bit. So yes. how did you... you know, yes, I think that's very true, because people, you know, I mean... You, people, if, you, if you interview different from people, you know, friends, yes. everybody will give you a different side yeah. to oh, them. yes, yes, so it's very definitely, to definitely. Yeah. write about someone who you do maybe know no, through that's somebody right. else's, you know... That's right. Um, I think you've got to kind of have come down on one side of the fence ultimately and say that, you know, from what I can see and from the, the amount of evidence that, that there is here, that she was um, increasingly self-actualized. 
Uh, so, and and less of, of the the image of her being like sad and miserable and, and, and lonely. And I, I am very convinced that it was the media and the press that, that just did that. She upset patriarchy. Okay.